Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another uh, ZEDEC seminar. Uh, this week we have uh, Renaud Vilmar, who will be talking about a minimal complete ZW calculi for QDIT and mixed dimensional systems. Please Renaud, take it away. All right, thanks for the introduction. So uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a joint work with uh, Marc Devim, who is also uh, among the, uh, the participant, I think, um, today on Zoom. Uh, so you can see there are a few uh, different keywords here. If you are not familiar with all of them, don't worry, I will, uh, I will go over them. Um, starting with, I guess, ZW calculus itself. So uh, I realize here is the ZX uh, seminar, but ZW is not far, very far from, uh, from ZX. We just use different generators for, for, for the diagrams. So it's a... Uh, just like ZX, um, we have string diagrams that appear to represent um, quantum computations, quantum operators, plus an equational theory to uh, connect together uh, diagrams that are semantically equivalent. So it's among the community, it's, uh, it's known as being the first um, uh, universal language or approximately universal language that was proven to be complete. So that means uh, the equational theory has enough equations uh, in it so that we can re uh, we can relate any two diagrams that are semantically equivalent. And the nice thing with the W calculus, which um, I really um, I really got got keen about um, lately, was uh, well is the nice combinatorics that comes with it, which I will talk about in the next slide, uh, as you will see. And this is something that I, I will try to uh, to keep when going to higher dimensions. And why do we want to go to higher dimensions, so beyond qubits? Well, the first obvious answer is uh, that we may want to uh, to represent um, and to manipulate uh, physics that uses um, basic bricks that are larger dimensional than just two dimensional. Um, so, for instance, qubits, uh, stuff like that. Uh, we may we may want to represent photonics, which by essence uses larger dimensional systems, and it can be used for compilation purposes. So, for instance, even if we just want to compile a qubit operator, it might be useful to get um, to exploit additional um, additional dimensions during the compilation. Also, I have to mention that uh, it's not the first. Well, the, what I'm going to present today is not the first result about completeness for QDITs and, and mixed dimensional systems. Um, last year at QPL, and then a few months later, we had a series of, uh, uh, well, there was a series of two papers um, dealing with um, um, first a QDIT version of ZXW calculus, so a mix of ZX and ZW calculus. And then, um, this uh, this result was extended to uh, uh, mixed dimensional systems. So I will talk uh, about it a little bit more as well. So in this talk, as you might have understood, uh, I'm going to present a ZW calculus for QDIT systems, and then for mixed dimensional systems. So I have two settings, two different settings here to show. And for both of these settings, um, I will show uh, that the equation theory that we uh, that we uh, provide is complete and uh, minimal as well okay so um i guess i have to uh, to uh, start giving the the generators of the language but before i do that i want to motivate motivate them from the the perspective of the combinatorics um, that goes with the qubit ZW calculus first. So, so first I want to do a small detour for the qubit ZW calculus, where here um, the one of well, the main primitive, I would even say, is the W generator. So it's a black node here, um, whose interpretation is the state, which is a uniform superposition of all the bit strings with weight one. Okay, so it's 0, 0, 0, 1, plus 0, 0, 1, 0, plus, etc., plus 1, 0, 0, 0. So the nice thing here is that if you uh, see a diagram with only W generators, uh, such as, as this one, so that's, that computes a scalar. 
and that scalar is not uh, is not random at all. It's uh, it's something very uh, very well defined from the graph itself, um, and we can see it from the interpretation of the W generator. The W generator tells you that you have to pretty much pick just one of its outgoing edges, um, and and only that. And we do the sum of all possible ways to pick. Uh, one of its outgoing edges. If we do that for all the W generators, for this small example here, for instance, what we compute is the number of selection of edges um, that touch each vertex exactly once. Okay, And this has a name in graph theory. This is called perfect matchings, actually. So what we do here is we count perfect matchings in the underlying graph. So this is the well, something that I find very, very interesting, very nice, um, and which can have um, far-reaching consequences because it relates to seemingly uh, different uh, areas of research. And this combinatorial perspective is, is something that I would like to keep uh, when going uh, to larger dimensions. The problem is we didn't find anything that really um, uh, well, that suits well, let's say, a, a very nice generalization of uh, perfect matchings to larger dimensions. So we had to rely on something else. Uh, what we did, though, here is uh, we, uh, we looked at this particular diagram. If we look at its uh, interpretation, either the first edge is not selected, is not part of the perfect matching. So that means the, the middle edge has to be because of this node here. Yeah. And then because of this node, since this edge is already selected to be in the perfect matching, the two other edges uh, cannot be. So if you have, uh, if your first edge here is not selected, then the two outgoing edges are not selected either. On the contrary, if the first edge is selected, then the middle one is not. And then uh, because of this node, we will have to, to choose um, one uh, one of the two is on the left or the right edge um, to be in the perfect matching. So if if we generalize this notion, so we uh, we make a generator out of this um, this small diagram here, and what this small generator does is that it allows to count paths that go through um, its uh, well its input. So you see you have. At the bottom, you have two edges. Actually, we can generalize to several edges, but at the top, we own, we always have just one. And when we count paths, we always count paths that go through the uh, the input edges, the input edge. Okay, so um, that's what we are going to do. We are going to count paths, um, and to help us out uh, in that regard, we uh, we have an additional generator here. A black node with a k as a parameter, uh, which simply creates k path out of nowhere. So with those two generators already, we can we can give a few uh, intuitions maybe about our diagrams. So the first one is when we plug um, two of those black nodes with parameter two. So we can see uh, under the hood what it does. So um, the first the first one creates two paths. Okay, here. And the uh, second one receives two paths. However, I haven't, uh, haven't named the, the path, so we can, we can actually do any permutation uh, that we want. So in that simple case, we just, what we're going to compute is the number of permutations. So it's going to be two. And more generally, we, when we have k, um, well, when we have two black nodes uh, with parameter k that are linked together, uh, what we compute is factorial k, which is the number of permutations um, on on uh, on a set of of size k. Okay, so far, so good. Uh, small other example is this one. So we have here a, um, a black node with parameter two connected to a W node and an upside down W node. I haven't properly defined what it is yet, but I think you can understand what it is. Uh, so again, under the hood, what, what happens is um, the first node here creates two paths. And then the two W nodes, they, um, um, they give the opportunity to either go left or right. 
So for each of those paths, we can either go left or right. So in that case, we just have um, four possible possible configurations. And at the end, we end up with still two paths. So actually, what we uh, compute here is something that is equivalent to just doing uh, four times the, uh, the node with the black node with uh, parameter two. And more generally, when we have parameter k here, each of the k paths can either go left or right. So we have two to the k times uh, this generator. Right? So maybe. Sorry, can, I, yeah. can I ask a question? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, why do you not have the top path going at the bottom and vice versa? Like for the two, you had the swap uh, on the top example? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so actually, the, this uh, choosing the permutation, I think, is better understood if we push it to um, to the upside down black node with uh, parameter k. So here it's the case that we have one, right? Here we don't, so we don't have to deal with it. Um, so it's actually a good question because this combinatorics is um, here for for now is more of an intuition than anything very formal. We haven't formalized it properly. Uh, so it's still a bit clunky. Uh, but I think it's better understood, as I said, uh, when we push the permutation, the, fa the fact that we choose permutations um, when there is an upside down um, black node. Maybe something that, that I can add is that yeah. uh, we still want the identity uh, to, to, be, to do nothing, because if we can add permutation at every identity, uh, mm -hmm. the combinatorics does not make any sense. You really want to add the permutation in a lazy way. So th this idea of permutation will only happen when we actually, uh, so when you plug a black node at the end, as long as you don't need to pick which uh, paths go where, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't add the permutation everywhere. Yeah, uh, thanks, that makes sense. Thank you, Mark. Um, Okay, so let's make this all a bit more formal, formal but not through combinatorics then. Um, what we are going to do is, well, uh, as usual with ZX or the W calculi, uh, we live in a, in a dagger compact prop. So uh, whenever we have two diagrams, we can compose them either in sequence or in parallel. Um, so like uh, these, two, uh, these two drawings here. We have particular generators. So we have the identity, which you have actually techn technically already seen. Uh, we have the swap, um, the swap generator that just switches places uh, for two qubits. And um, this swap together with uh, a bunch, well, with the other uh, generators satisfies some conditions for it to be uh, to be a dagger compact prop. Actually, to be a dagger compact prop, we also need uh, cups and caps, which allow us, in a sense, to uh, to deform diagrams at will. So we have this well, these uh, few equations. We also have the fact that our generators will um, also satisfy some um, some rules about deformation of diagrams. So uh, if you are familiar with ZX or ZW, we will have, as you will see, a white node with parameter R, um, whose legs are completely, uh, can completely be swapped. Okay, so you can have any permutation sigma here, and we will always have that uh, equality here. For the W node, it's a, just a little bit more subtle. As I, as I said already, we have one particular input, which is completely different from the other edges. Um, so all the output edges, we can, again, we can really uh, permit them at will, uh, but not, not with the, uh, the input one. Okay, and uh, we have something similar to uh, the uh, uh, only connectivity matters in ZX. Uh, so diagrams are always considered up to deformation to make things simpler. simpler. Okay, so together with this, so the, the Compact structure also allows us to define things upside down. Upside down. Again, that's fairly usual. The, the upside down W node is defined like this. Uh, the upside down version of the uh, well, cat one 
which will be bra one is defined like this. And also we uh, add a few, uh, well, a little bit, a little uh, syntactic sugar for k zero here. And also for, for the black node with arbitrary parameter, we can actually always um, decompose it as a W node and um, the cat one. So actually we only need as a, as a pure generator, we only need the cat one. The cat case will be defined inductively as such. Okay. So now uh, let's uh, look at what uh, these generators represent exactly. So I haven't fixed it yet, but now I'm doing it. So let's, let's fix the dimension D. Um, and what's going to happen is that every single um, wire in the diagram uh, will represent a C to the D um, uh, space. Okay. So we have an interpretation. So something that takes a diagram of ZW uh, and maps it to, um, to a morphism of this category, QDD, which is uh, a subcategory of an eight dimension of Hilbert spaces. More specifically, it's the category where all the objects are n fold tensors of C to the D, and when morphi and where morphisms are linear maps between, uh, between such spaces. Okay, so obviously this, uh, this interpretation preserves the two, the two compositions uh, together with the fact that the identity is preserved. Um, this tells us that this, uh, this is really a monoidal functor. Um, okay, so here you have the usual, I think, um, interpretation for the identity, the swap, the cup and the cap. If anything is unclear, don't hesitate to, uh, to interrupt, of course. Um, and then, we, well, the, the black node with parameter one is just interpreted as cat one. And to make things simpler, we also have, among the generators, we have the um, um, this parameter here, which is just a global scalar. So it can be any complex number. And its interpretation is the, well, the scalar itself. Okay, now let's uh, head towards the most difficult uh, generators. So first, the W node. So I, we decided to, to go with the NRE W node here. Um, so you can understand, understand, understand it as follows. So when, whenever you have ket k as input, um, you will sum over all possible ways to decompose k as a sum of n integers. Okay, so you want i1, i2, up, up to in, that sum to k. And then you will do as a, as a, as a, as a coefficient, um, square root of the monomial, um, k choose i1, i2, in. And you will output, uh, ket i1, ket i2, ket in. Okay, so that's, that's, um, our way to, uh, to tell, um, that if we have let's say, k-path uh, um, going through the input, then it will be uh, distributed over all its inputs, all its outputs, so. Okay. And then we have um, the white node. So it's very similar to the z-spider of the, of the zx calculus, or even the generalization of zw calculus, except for uh, this coefficient here which is rather unusual, I think. So it's a square root of factorial k to the power um, DRT of the node plus two, minus two, sorry, minus two. Um, and the reason it's here is um, pretty much to make, uh, well, to make the, the equation of theory simpler. So we are really um, taking the approach here to make the, well, to try and not compute uh, the interpretations when when we uh, can avoid it. So um, so we we want to make the equational theory as simple as as possible, and uh, the cost we pay for it is is an interpretation that is a little bit more complex than than anticipated. Okay. 
I have a question before yes. moving on. So how do you decide the scalar here for the linear map definition? Like, why did you choose this uh, square root of k factorial? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so maybe I will, uh, uh, will already... Well, maybe just in a few words, yes. quickly. Very uh, quickly. I mean, just go, come go. back to the scalar. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to, to the scalar. The, uh, so the reason why there is a square root the same reason why you have some square root in some version of semantic of ZX is because you're splitting the scalar between uh, two generators. And uh, here you have a square root because what we want is we want a binomial, a binomial coefficient. On, uh, we will need to choose to either put it on the black node that is upside down or on the black node that is uh, uh, up, uh, downside up. Uh, and so we instead we split it into co two coefficients. So here the square root is just a way to have a balance equational theory. Mm -hmm. And the core here uh, is the fact that we have a uh, multinomial coefficient, or if you take the black note with two input, a binomial coefficient. And this is really uh, the combinatorics that is behind. We are counting the number of paths or the number of perfect matching. And this counting operation uh, it, it actually corresponds to selecting, to literally selecting uh, n among k or something like that. And you will have from the combinatorics we try to emulate this coefficient that appears. Or this factorial for the uh, white node. So it really comes from, uh, we have the factorial or binomial that come from the combinatorics we try to emulate and the square root that comes from the fact that we want to have a symmetric presentation. So we need to split the coefficient in two. And by symmetric, you mean if you take the dagger of this diagram, then you will yeah. have a similar? Yes, yes, indeed. OK, thanks. Um, so the, I, can, I can tell you just a little bit about the story of how we got to that point. Um, we decided to go with this W node. Um, so uh, I don't know if I will talk about it, but um, the W node that you can find in ZXW is not the, not this one, uh, very uh, very interestingly. Uh, it's a different one. Uh, this one is actually rather closer to the QPass generator, the triangle from the QPass generator. So it has uh, motivations from, uh, from photonics, actually. So this one made sense for us. We will, well, we could choose actually any uh, uh, any generalization of the W node that we wanted. Uh, we just decided to go with this one. And then the reason why we end up with uh, square root of factorial k here, um, it really comes from the fact that now that we had fixed an interpretation for the W node, uh, we wanted to have some specific equations in the equational theory. And the best way to have all the equations that we wanted was to tweak the, the coefficients in the Z spider. And that's how we ended up with this square root of factorial. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so let's move on. Well, yeah, related works. So already mentioned a few things here. So first of all, uh, well, the qubit ZW calculus, which I've already mentioned. Uh, was introduced by Bob Kuku and Alex Kissinger back in 2011. And it was uh, modified and made complete, or proven to be complete, uh, by Yamar Adziazanovich in 2015. Uh, and it can be really seen as a restriction of our language when we just take d equals 2. So technically, the generators are a little bit different, but there is, uh, there is really a connection between the two. Uh, a big difference between Amar's ZW and ours is that we don't have a permanent swap. Um, so I will talk a bit, just a little bit about it uh, uh, later. Something else that um, that is related is QPath, which I mentioned uh, just now, where our W node this is really a finite dimensional version of their triangle generator. And also our one to one Z node, so one Z, uh, Z node with one input and one output is really, again, a finite dimensional version of the weight line in, in QPath. 
Okay, so another related work is directly from uh, Amar Hadzirzanovich series, where he already fleshed out a lot of um, generators that would be needed for, for a QD version of ZW, except that uh, he used Q arithmetic instead of the usual arithmetic that we use. Um, so using Q arithmetic means pretty much you're, you redefine the multinomial coefficients and the factorial co coefficients in a different way with respect to a parameter Q. Um, so it turns out it's what we end up with is a little bit different because we don't use Q arithmetic, but usually uh, otherwise the generators are pretty much the same. Um, also from, from his series, we, uh, well, uh, we can already find the normal form that we are going to use uh, for the completeness result. Uh, speaking of normal, normal form, uh, this normal form can also be found uh, in a very close uh, uh, way, close form to in uh, in uh, the paper ZXW. So by Paul Wang, Sheikh, uh, Ye, Jung, Kuke, back in 2023, well, back last year. Um, it's interesting to notice here that um, one of the equations um, of the equational theory, which is called the W by algebra. Uh, so it, as I said already, it uses a, diff a different W node, but interestingly, the W by algebra that they use uh, works very well for us as well. So we, we uh, really took inspiration here uh, for our W by algebra. And this redefinition of the W by algebra, by algebra is precisely the reason why we don't need a fermion X swap, which is already the case for, for them, actually. Um, we will see it in the equation of theory uh, that is coming. And as I said, uh, the normal form that they have is, again, very close to the one that we, we are using here. Uh, so speaking of normal form, um, we we'll first do something that is pretty uh, pretty um, boilerplate in the community, which is to use the map state duality, which we can do since we have a compact structure. So using the map state duality, instead of focusing on operators in general, we can just focus on states. So it's a, it's a, little, a little bit simpler. Um, and when we are given a, a specific state, psi here, as a, sum, a weighted sum of um, the, the classical um, classical states, we can simply turn it into a diagram like this, where every coefficient and every term in the sum ends up as a white node in the middle, in the middle of the diagram. And the coefficient uh, here, so R, Ri, ends up inside the W node, in the parameter of the W node, together with um, square, a square root of uh, factorials again. Um, so here, this square root of factorials is again an artifact of the uh, the uh, interpretation that we chose for the for the generators. Um, but again, the normal form usually is not something that you will deal with uh, when you manipulate diagrams. So again, yeah, it's it's. It's not something that you will really usually see. Um, so of course, we didn't choose this form for the diagram uh, uh, randomly. Uh, we chose it because it does preserve the interpretation. So if we take the interpretation of that diagram, we end up with the state we started with. And the nice thing about this is, I've got to move that around, sorry is that it gives us universality. So for any morphism um, in QDIT, there exists a diagram that represents it, very simply. OK, so now we're going to use this normal form to uh, prove completeness of the, uh, the equational theory. And the equational theory, precisely, is given here. So everything fits in just one slide, and all the the equations are fairly either um, well are either um, usual in the community or are fairly uh, intuitive. So I'm just going to go quickly through them. The first one is the well, that spider rule that tells you you can merge together white white nodes that are adjacent. 
something that you have in ZX and ZW, usually. This one comes from the associativity of the binary W node when seen as a monoid together with the, uh, the unit that, that is K0. So it's really, again, a merging of, um, of uh, two W nodes. A w, node, a w node that has one input and one output is just the identity, so it's pretty clear. Uh, here we have an hop flake rule, uh, which tells us that if we have D wires in parallel between the white node and the outputs of a W node, then you can just remove them. Okay. Um, then we have a bi algebra rule between a white node and a W node, like this. We have so the W bi algebra, which uh, I mentioned already. Um, and as I said, so we don't need the permanent swap here, usually. Well, in the qubit version, uh, you can find it as a, as a fermionic swap here. So it's a, an alternative version of the swap, let's say, uh, which we don't need here if we include this context. Okay, so that's something that, uh, that works uh, exactly like this uh, in the ZXW paper and which we uh, we used again here. Then we have this rule that just um, tells us we can we can sum together um, the parameters of two Z spiders using using a W node. This node, yeah, well, this rule that tells us we can get rid of a particular diagram which has uh, which represents a scalar one. We have a copy rule for the cat one. Um, and then we have a rule that is specific to the QDIT version here. So, so usually uh, we can't get rid of loops, of self loops on uh, Z, uh, Z spiders. Um, so for the categorically inclined among you, that means that the Frobenius algebra that is lying behind the, the Z spider is not special in our case. It's not special precisely because of the fact of the, the coefficients square root of factorial k that is found in the interpretation of the z-spider. However, with enough context, then uh, we can make sure that we can indeed remove the loop. So while the loop cannot be removed in general, in that particular context, when we have uh, get one plugged on a, on a W node here, then here we can remove it. OK, and next we have, finally, um, another way to represent the white node. So the white node uh, with no input and one output is just, uh, well, it's a weighted sum of all the classical states from zero to uh, D minus one, which is something that you can obtain by taking uh, K D minus one and plugging it on the W node and post-selecting post um, appropriately on one of its input, of, of its outputs, so. and uh, the appropriate um, post selection is precisely the white node with. Uh, any question on the uh, equational theory before I move on? I had a question about algebra. So why does it not work when n equals zero? Ah, good question. Yes. Um, it just just doesn't work. Um, so actually, um, I I don't think it does in the qubit version already. Um, so I, I, I think the, uh, I think it works in the infinite dimensional case. I'm not yep. hundred percent sure, but I think it does work. Exactly, exactly. Uh, we found out. Uh, so in the in the next setup, uh, in the next setting, when we go to mixed dimensional. ZW calculus. Um, we found out that indeed, if you deal with the the dimensions in the right way, then you do have a bi algebra with uh, n equals zero. Uh, so maybe pretty much a copy of the white node. Uh, but maybe uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe yeah. something uh, that is behind this n different of zero and also behind h and b two and the context of b two is really the fact that here we are at fixed dimension D. Exactly. So each time, uh, so we have, we go from K0 to K diamond D minus one. 
And uh, you really have this idea that if the cat should would be for some reason higher than die uh, that d minus one, then uh, the computation is reset to zero, the diagram crash, whatever. You have really the fact that you have a, a cap, uh, a, a, a limit at d minus one. That's what is saying the H rule. The H rule is saying that if you have d wire, you will go over the dimension in some way. Uh, that's why it is well, that what is saying the B2 rule. Uh, the B2 rule is really saying that on the left hand side, uh, if you if the if the, if the cat that goes uh, in the middle wire uh, is too high, uh, the diagram will have a problem, and that's something that you will miss in the uh, yeah sorry on the left hand side. The middle wire uh, is really saying that the uh, to, the the uh, the sum of all the wire is really doing some work by saying that here this value cannot be bigger than the than d, d, d minus one, and that's really what is doing the weird context on the right. The weird context is just saying, oh, by the way, the sum of the value on those two wires cannot be greater than d minus one, and that's the same thing that we will be and. That the same thing that the same kind of problem that forces us to put n uh, different from zero on B1. Uh, because uh, if you take n equals zero on B1, uh, your diagram will go from some connect diagram to some uh, disconnected diagram. And you will mm -hmm. lose some information about the sum of two values being uh, necessarily lesser than d minus one. And this loss of information does not happen in infinite dimension where you don't have this limit anymore because you you don't you no longer say well if it's, if it is bigger than infinity uh, you don't say anything like that so this n no. different of zero is really part of that information yeah thank you yeah. so just maybe to complete the answer, uh, in the mixed dimensional uh, the w calculus that I will present next. Um, we we indeed uh, found out that we there was a version of the the by algebra with n equals zero, but then you have to really make sure that the the dimensions are um, well verify some condition, and I think the condition was that um, the dimension that you have here has to be exactly the sum of the dimensions uh, that uh, that are output here. So. Here, since we have a fixed dimension d, uh, obviously it cannot work. But in the uh, the mixed dimensional case, um, we had considered it as an axiom. It's a, it turns out we can we can get rid of it eventually, uh, but we had considered it. Okay. Uh, so you may you may have noticed here that there is um, there is no funky factorial or multinomial coefficients, well except for that. For that global scalar here, yeah. but otherwise in the diagrams there is um, there is none of those uh, multinomial and, and factorial coefficients, and yet in the normal form of the ZW diagrams we do have square roots of uh, factorials. So you may wonder where those come from, and we actually um, asked ourselves this question for for quite a long time until we ended up with the following example. So, so this serves also for me as an example to show you how to use the equational theory to prove stuff. Um, and the lemma is going to be, uh, to be the following. So you have on the left a fairly simple diagram. So, so you have um, a bipartite graph of W nodes between N and M nodes here. And the top N nodes are also um, gathered into a, a, a Z spider. It turns out that this can be turned into the following diagram, where you have a bunch of white nodes in the middle connected to uh, W nodes at the top and the bottom, and where the, the factors here are multinomial coefficients. Um, so where does this come, does this come from? Uh, what we are going to do here is going to we are going to assume the following. Um, the following thing, which is fairly easy to prove from B2 here. Okay. So it's a slightly generalized version of B2. Um, and then 
from from there, what we are going to do is prove this by uh, by induction, where the the base case is simple enough that I haven't in, uh, included it. Um, but since well, if you if you trust me that there is the the, the base case is indeed true, um, then we can prove the uh, the induction step as follows. So we we assume we have n plus one nodes here. So we do induction on on n actually. Um, we assume we, we have n plus one nodes here. We first do a by algebra, uh, ZW by algebra between this white node and this W node. Uh, we end up with this diagram where uh, we can now use the W by algebra rule on all the pairs of W nodes here. And where uh, the top W node here serves as the context. So it serves really, it's, it's really this W node that you see here in B2 prime. So you end up with uh, this diagram, which now has, I think, M different white nodes here, and actually M different occurrences of this diagram. So now we can use the induction hypothesis, replace all the M, well, those M occurrences of the left diagram here by the right diagram. We end up with this big diagram here. Um, and then it's just a case of doing again ZW by algebra between the pairs of Z nodes and W nodes here, here, and here. And then gathering the W nodes that, um, that we get out of them um, into this one and I don't remember if there's some rearranging of the nodes. I think yes, there's a bit of rearranging of the nodes with the uh, the merging of the W nodes at the bottom. And then all the white nodes that have exactly the same connectivity with the W nodes, the output W nodes and the input W node, they can be summed together. And it turns out that all the sums of monomials that you have is exactly, well, are exactly the ones that you need to create monomials uh, where we choose from n plus one instead of n. So there is some, 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 some rather funky, uh, uh, funky uh, combinatorics there as well. Um, and this is where all the monomial coefficients come from. This, this lemma turned out to be very useful to prove completeness in the end. Sorry, so, I have a question. So at the end, like before the uh, the last diagram and the second to the last diagram, you said um, you can combine all of this uh, and choose uh, I1 all the way to IM. Are you doing addition between different boxes? Yes, uh, yes, we are using the, the, the plus rule. Technically, the plus rule, uh, which is a bit generalized as well. So this plus rule here is this one, OK? Mm -hmm. Uh, it actually also works when you have several W nodes and you have exactly the same um, connections between the two white nodes. I should have I should have uh, um, included this as well, the generalization, so that it's, it's clearer. Uh, but yes, that's how we do the sum of uh, the parameters of some parameters in the, the white nodes. Right. And another of my question is, if you can you go back to the yes. rules? Sure. So in ZX calculus, uh, there's color symmetry. And do you mm -hmm. also have color symmetry for the equational theory in this table? No, for example, does the bioalgebra rule there also works for the X spiders with the face R? Uh, you mean this one? Yeah. Ah, uh, you mean if you if you remove if you if you replace the Z spider by an X spider? Yeah. I don't think in general, in general, I don't think it will work. Um, no, you, you would need but... to also replace the black spider by uh, some kind of variant of it, I, I guess. Well, yeah, the one that you get from uh, the change of basis that gets you from the Z spider to the W spider for each. But... And yes, it's not um, it's not invariant by, by this uh, change of basis, I think. So, um, so, so no, <laughs> technically here we, um, 
everything that we give here, unless you you check it uh, thoroughly, everything that we give that is given here is uh, will only work with the Z spider and not the X spider. Oh, so wait, can I understand that in this table, the only color symmetry that you have is the fusion rule and everything else is just exactly the coloring that you're presenting here? I think so, yes. Okay. yes, yes. Um, the, yeah, uh, in ZX, in ZW, so in ZW, you don't really consider the X spider. Um, you really focus on having Z, the Z spider and the W node. Mm -hmm. um, and the X spider, we haven't really looked at how it behaves with our W node. Um, so the, the, the paper about ZXW does uh, look at the behavior between ZX, XW, and ZW, but with a different W node. Uh, so it's not really something that we have looked looked at here with our version of the W. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, getting to completeness, finally. Um, finally, so, so completeness, um, if you're not familiar with it, so here I've given completeness and soundness together. Uh, so it really tells you that you can turn one diagram into, in, into another whenever the two diagrams are semantically equivalent. So that tells you that uh, you have enough equations in your equational theory. Um, to completely capture semantic semantical equivalence. So in particular, uh, if you have two diagrams that share the same interpretation, then they can be turned into one another using the, the rules in the equational theory from the previous slide. So the way we prove this is, uh, again, fairly straightforward. If you've already looked at completeness results, um, what we do is we turn every generator in normal form. Then we show that any composition of uh, diagrams in normal form can also be put in normal form. And then uh, you just have to show that the normal form is unique. And from there, you can show that whenever you have two diagrams that are semantically equivalent, they can both be turned into exactly the same normal form. So that gives you, uh, that gives you completeness. Um, so we have proven that. Okay, so it's, it's a bit technical, especially because uh, we started from, um, from an equational theory that is as simple as we, as we could. Um, but we ended up with completeness. So we have enough equations in our equational theory to represent, well, to completely capture semantical equivalence. But we actually have um, exactly uh, what we need. Exactly as many, uh, exactly enough equations. So what I mean by that is we have minimality, um, which means that removing any equation in the equational theory results in losing the completeness. So every single equation in the equational theory is necessary for completeness. The way we prove it is um, again something that is. Uh, well known if you if you've been interested in minimality, um, what we do is for every equation in the equational theory we want to find an interpretation um, that will preserve all the equations of the equational theory except uh, the one that we are uh, considering precisely. So, for instance, if we want to show that the 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 plus rule, so the one that allows you to sum together parameters of the Z spider is necessary. Uh, what we do is we take an interpretation that preserves completely the, the diagrams, except that um, it turns the Z parameters into their absolute values. And the same for the global scalar. So it's very simple. We just You just take your diagram you just, from a given diagram. You just take all the parameters in the Z spiders, and you take their absolute value. And so this works because uh, you can look at all the equations that we have. Uh, this one is preserved, obviously, because the product of two absolute values is the absolute value of the product. Uh, this one obviously holds, this one as well, this one as well. 
Uh, this one holds because it holds for any complex number. So if it holds for any complex number, then it also holds for a non-negative real number. This one holds, obviously. And this one does not. This one does not. Why? Because the sum of two absolute values is not the absolute value of the sum in general. Then this one holds. This one holds because uh, we took the same uh, convention for the for the global scalar. So if we map R to its uh, absolute value, here it's the same. Um, this one works as well. This one works as well. So doing so, we have found an interpretation that preserves all the equations except this one. And what it tells us is that this equation here cannot be a consequence of the others. And because of that, it's necessary. If we, if we remove it, then we lose completeness. And then what I've uh, shown here for one equation, you have to do it for each individual equation so that there is an, an interpretation that will uh, preserve all the other equations except this one and not this one. So having minimality together with completeness is uh, well, it's a bit uh, it's a bit subtle. There is a lot of going back and forth between um, between well the 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 set of rules that you want to have in your equational theory um, together with well the proof of minimality. Sometimes you find out that really you can't uh, you can't manage to uh, to show that those two equations uh, um, are necessary individually, but you can show that at least one of the two is necessary, so that hints towards the fact that maybe there is a way to prove one together, with, well, uh, provided the other, and stuff like that. So there is a lot of going back and forth um, in order to flesh out the, the, the equational theory that you start with to make it minimal. Um, but in the end, you end up with uh, what I think is a pretty, uh, pretty neat and 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 intuitive equational theory. Okay, so I think we can go now to mixed dimensions. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go quick now. Um, the idea now is that you don't want the wires to have a fixed dimension d, but to allow any finite dimension uh, to be in the wires. Uh, so here we have an interpretation that will go from our ex new extension of the W calculus to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, uh, which again is going to be a monoidal functor. Um, as you can see, we label the wires with uh, some integer k and integer a, which is um, which is not directly the dimension; it's the dimension minus one. Uh, we decided to uh, to do that, so we call that capacity of the wire, um, because it, well, we may, it, we we decided to do that because it makes um, a lot of equations and and derivations simpler. Um, so everything is is pretty standard, I think, and then we uh, generalize the Z and W spiders. So first, the Z spider. Uh, as you can see, we um, we decided that all the legs of the Z spider were going to be of the same dimension. Um, so that way, we can just put the, the the capacity annotation on the Z spider itself, rather than on each of its individual legs. Um, the reason we chose to do that is because we still have this um, this interpretation, this this combinatoric interpretation where the Z spider is actually a hyper edge in a hypergraph. So in that case, it makes sense that all the, the legs of the Z spider have the same dimension. And so the, the, the way we are going to be able to go from one dimension to the other is through the generalization of the, of the, Z, of the W node here, um, which is just a, a straightforward generalization of the one we had before. Um, we just have to cap the possible values in a given wire by uh, by its capacity. Pretty much. So nothing too fancy here, I think. Um, again, we have a normal form. Uh, it's exactly the same as previously, except that 
Um, we have different um, uh, annotation, capacity annotations on the output wires. And we can make all the uh, inner wires to be uh, of capacity one. Okay. Um, so again, we have the fact that the interpretation of this diagram is the, the state we started with. Um, so this N here really defines the normal form, which is unique. Again, we have, uh, as a corollary of the existence of such a normal form, we have universality. So for any morphism in, uh, finite, dimensional, uh, in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, we have a diagram that represents it. And then we can um, extend or adapt uh, the previous equational theory to one that works for mixed dimensional systems. Uh, so there is a lot of those that are exactly the same as previously. I will just emphasize on a few of those. So um, the, the fusion of the W nodes here now comes with a side condition, uh, pretty much because B disappears from left to right. So you still need to have some, well, to check a few, a few things bef before you apply uh, this operation from left to right. And this is hidden in the side condition here. Um, the rule on the right here is precisely here to um, to cope with the failings of uh, the, the the equation on the left. Um, so when B here is completely arbitrary, and we want to fuse two W nodes together, um, we may have no other choice than to uh, push B into a context in some sense here on the input wires. Um, another thing, which this time is nice, is that the bi-algebra, the W bi-algebra rule uh, becomes simpler. We don't have the, the, uh, the context anymore. However, we do have a few side conditions uh, that we have to, to verify in order to apply the rule. Um, something that changes again is the loop removal rule, um, where this time, well, the, well, we needed a context uh, back in the QLED version, uh, and this context is completely enca encapsulated in the, in the capacity annotation here. So this one becomes simpler as well. And then something that is very specific to um, the mixed dimensional case, uh, which is a rule that tells you that ket1 can be embedded in larger, in larger dimensions uh, through the W node. Um, okay, so well, this slide is going to be very similar to the one for qubit systems. So we have completeness of the language. This time the proof is a bit different. Instead of reproving that uh, everything can be turned in normal form, etc., we can leverage the mixed dimensional case because we are so close to it, actually. Um, so what we do is, uh, from a mixed dimensional diagram, um, we first turn it into a QD diagram, in some sense. Then we use the QD completeness to turn this diagram into a QD normal form. Then we show that the diagram in QD normal form can be put in mixed dimensional normal, normal form. And finally, uh, using the uniqueness of mixed dimensional normal form, we can conclude um, and show that uh, any two diagrams that are semantically equivalent will reduce to the same normal form. And again, we have minimality. So removing any equations, any equation in the previous set of equations um, results in losing completeness. Okay, so that leads me to the end of my talk. So to recap what we did here, um, so we defined two uh, graphical calculi, two ZW calculi for respectively QDIT and mixed dimensional quantum mechanics. We showed completeness and minimality of the two, uh, the two settings. And what we want to do now um, to continue with this line of research is first to, to get a better grasp of the combinatorics um, that I showed uh, while wa waving my hands at the beginning of the talk. Uh, we want to have a look at links, pot potential links with photonics and, and computing permanence, uh, which is something that we are doing with uh, 
um, a PhD student of the team right now. It might be worth looking at uh, whether we can adapt our results to QR arithmetics. Um, so going back to the, um, the the generators directly provided by uh, by Amar in his in his thesis. Uh, but again, there are well in that case uh, some some equations in the equational theory will hold, and some of them completely will completely break. So it will need a complete um, rearranging of the rules, definitely, if we want to do that. And finally, something that we uh, are looking at right now is uh, uh, to extend the languages again, and this time going infinite dimensional. Uh, so yeah, that concludes my talk, and uh, thank you for your attention. All right, uh, thank you very much, Renaud, for the, for the talk. Uh, I see people are doing the clappy emoji thing in Zoom, very nice. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I want to, like, I'm very excited by the uh, minimality results, and I want to know how the bi-algebra uh, necessity mm -hmm. Uh, goes. Can you can you say a bit more about that? Like, how do you prove that bi-algebra is necessary? Uh, so which bi-algebra, the B one or B two? Um, I mean either. They're I think they are both like related to some effective part. Like it seems like they're related to so whichever is easier to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will start by B two because because it's uh it's kind of amusing actually. It's uh, it's a bit of a hack. Um, the way we prove its uh, its minimality. Um, so something that I haven't discussed actually here, and that maybe I should have, is our minimality result is weak in a sense. It's weak in the following sense that all the equations that we have here are well, a lot of them are actually um, axiom schemas, right? They don't work. Uh, there's except for a few like L or, or H. Um, a lot of the axioms here uh, work for actually a family of axioms. They are technically a family of axioms. So for instance, here you can modulate in between, you can modulate the number of input wires and the number of output wires. Um, so the, main, the minimality result that we have is weak in the sense that what we showed is that at least one of the occurrences of the rule is necessary. But we don't show which one. So potentially for B2, maybe maybe only one of the occurrences is needed and not um, all possible um, well, uh, pairs of uh, N and M uh, occurrences, right? And actually it's, uh, it's well known that, uh, yeah, I think it, it should work, uh, that as soon as you have the Bayer algebra for two and two, two inputs and two outputs, then you can go to uh, larger, a larger number of inputs and a larger number of outputs. Um, so B2, getting back to B2, um, so the way we prove its uh, minimality is a bit of a hack. If I remember correctly, uh, the what, what, what we do is we use the fact that it introduces a context. Um, and you see on the left, you don't have Z nodes. You don't have Z spiders, but on the right you do. And actually, uh, if you look at all the other equations, you realize that B2 is the only one that can either introduce Z spiders that are connected to the diagram. If you start with, with a diagram that doesn't have Z spiders, if you go from left to right, or if you go right to left, it's the only rule that allows you to completely remove um, Z spiders from the diagram. Yeah, more generally, our bi-algebra are never perfect. There is always, it's a bi-algebra, and there is these small details. And uh, when, we, when we prove minimality, we always prove that uh, these small details is actually necessary. And these small details is the one that needs to be in some axiom, in some axiom of any kind. We uh, we had a few attempts at trying minimality of the concept of bi-algebra, but they always fail, and each time, uh, we went back to, well, there is this thing in the axiom that is not the bi-algebra, but that comes with it, and this thing is necessary. And for yeah, the same is, thing for B1, also... 
Uh, something mm. for B1. Uh, actually, B1, uh, we didn't show the minimality of the fact that uh, we need an axiom that swap uh, a, a white node and a black node. But I believe that this axiom, when the what we show is that we need an axiom that duplicate uh, the R. Um, so, oh, I'm not it, sure anymore. Oh, no, 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 I, I don't not, remember not, if what... it was not something about paths. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, that was something about paths. Yeah, this one breaks, yes. this action breaks paths uh, that goes through, uh, that goes only through white node or something like that. Yes. Uh, yes, so, yes exactly. so how does that path uh, argument work? Because, like, like, would you be able to, like, for example, uh, generalize this to just qubit ZX to prove ZX biology there necessity there? Okay. Well, the, it seems kind of just about like connectivity. The the point about uh, the bioalgebra in ZX is pretty much that um, it is it well it it has the same minimality as we do here. Uh, in the sense that um, usually in ZX you can you can find the Bay algebra with two inputs and two outputs, and then you have the copy rule as a separate uh, as a separate rule, right? And the copy rule you can show it's it's uh, it is necessary, but the Bay algebra we still can't really uh, have um, uh, a good argument for it, um, and it, it's. Pretty much the same case for us here. Um, the fact that it works in our case is that we just um, bunched together the copy rule and the bialgebra rule into just one, uh, just one equation. Oh, so if you put the the copy rule and the bialgebra rule together, like with the multi-legged one, like that yeah, would be minimal. Fails in that case. So it would be oh. minimal for qubit as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, can I ask an extension to that question? So you say mm -hmm. a lot of these rules are uh, ex are like ex axiom schemas, but yes. many of them I assume can sort of be made into a finite set of rules, like this is CP or is it OP? What's it, what's it called? This yeah. could be made into like a single rule uh, by like CP, yes. Yes. Fine addition, right? It's, um, yes, a single yes, rule of like R. Like you you need to parameterize it in the terms of the scalar of like the the phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We so were... there, was, there was definitely a design choice here. Um, we decided to have as um, well, as little axioms as possible, but at the same time, we wanted to these axioms to be uh, to be powerful enough to uh, uh, to uh, well, to be able to use it um, to use the equational theory without too much hassle. And it's already uh, it's already um, quite convoluted how you start uh, bootstrapping your um, your derivations to get to completeness. Um, so indeed, obviously, CP could be could be could be broken down. I think in two cases: the one when you have no output whales, um, and the one where you have two. And then the rest will be a case of using the spider rule. Um, yeah, I, I believe I looked at trying to uh, do everything with zero and two. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had problem showing. I had I had problem showing minimality of a few things. For example, just if you take a, uh, the one that is doing the associativity at the top, uh, show uh, showing that the axiom that allow you to uh, to just to do the associativity swap, going from uh, two uh, you take two black nodes with two input and you just swap them to do the associativity of black node. Uh, that axioms, uh, it's just, I mean, those axioms that are really fundamental breaks, I will need to have more uh, understanding of, uh, I mean, uh, what, these, uh, what are these stru the theoretical structures that are behind to really understand why that thing as simple as associativity is really necessary. Whereas here in this general case, in the NRE case, uh, the uh, with the argument is much easier to set up because we can just pick a number of input output where we have an argument rather than being restricted to the binary case. Yeah, we had, um, we had the same issues when I was trying to prove minimality of phase freeze at age. Like if I break it down into actual individual finite rules, then uh, it's much harder to show necessity for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Um, That's also one of the reasons we, we went for... <laughs> 
for actions, it's nice. equations that are already uh, already pretty general. Um, Sarah, you have a question? Uh, thank you. I have also several questions, but I'll ask the one that I'm about to forget. So earlier you talk about you have the, uh, you, when you have the mixed dimensional uh, ZW calculus, you can reduce it to the QDIT uh, mm -hmm. ZX, ZW calculus. I wonder, is the logic being, if you look at all of the dimensions, you pick the maximum of them such that you can treat all the wires that have lower dimension as a higher dimension version, but you just have those states being nulled, and then you can just apply the, the normal form for the QDIT dimension to it. Absolutely, yes. Uh, that's what we do. Um, when we do so, so pretty much that, that means we embed every generator into, the, into larger dimensions. Uh, so we pick indeed the maximum capacity, the maximum dimension inside the diagram. And what will be left at the end is a diagram that is completely queued it for a fixed D. Mm -hmm. And then for the outputs, because you still have uh, output wires, um, for, for them you will have, on them you will have um, projectors that will, that will go from D to the actual uh, dimension um, that, is, uh, that comes with uh, the output. Of the data. Yeah, in the in the future, Rick, you said you want to generalize this to the infinite dimensional case. Yep. So in the uh, in the Fox ZX paper, we kind of um, like if you consider the Fox spider and the W spider fragment, that's that's like a in a way that's a, that's generalization of this to infinite dimensions. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, do you have do you have any thoughts on like how you might want to prove um? Universality or completeness for infinite dimensional case because that's okay. because you don't have a normal form there. So uh, maybe I should give credit where it's due. First, the the, the reason we uh, wondered about infinite dimensions first was uh, through an, an idea of Mark, uh, where he, I think he wasn't very pleased with the well the, already the fact that we have a ton of annotations on the wires. Um, in the mixed dimensional case. And also we have some side conditions that are a bit annoying to deal with. Um, so his idea was to, well, go back to a prop by pushing all the dimensions to be uh, infinite. Um, so that was the starting idea. Uh, what we came up with for now, because it's still work in progress, uh, what we came up with is, um, so, so, so the, Morphisms we represent are morphisms that preserve finiteness of the support. So all the states that we consider are states where the support is finite. The support is seen uh, when seen when the state is seen as an infinite dimensional vector. Um, our all our states are will be uh, will be um, of finite support, and all the morphisms that we that we allow. Are morphisms that preserve finiteness of the support. So it goes infinite dimensional in some sense, but it still keeps a lot of finiteness in it. Um, so if we do that, we have some, some preliminary results, let's say. Um, we can already do everything that we could do in mixed dimensional ZW calculus. Uh, we can also do QPath, interestingly. And we can do actually a mix of the two. Um, uh, but then we are stuck at... Um... Yeah, basically, we, ha we, have, a, we have a normal we have a normal form that is unique for a mix of the two that is really ad hoc. And uh, yeah, that's... Uh, we're trying to generalize it uh, to, to, to include, I mean... Uh, our, our language is more general than this ad hoc mix. Basically, we have a normal form that is unique for a sub-language of our language uh, th that is more restrictive. And uh, we had an intern working on uh, the generalization, but uh, it's really uh, the infinite dimension really had a lot of effects that is uh, that, that, are, that, that make proving uniqueness of the normal form really difficult mm -hmm. in general. 
because you no longer have this simple, oh, well, I will just look at the matrix of this in the semantics and every coefficient of the matrix corresponds to that generator, generator because now your semantics is infinite. So you cannot you you want you cannot just have one generator per coefficient in your matrix, and uh, and uh, so yes yeah, so uh, we have uh, we'll see if something goes out of it, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we have uh, we have some idea of what we want for an equational theory. We are just not I mean and but we just don't know that this equational theory is not complete and uh, we're trying to find which axiom to add to uh, have completeness uh, so for if, if you're going to if you're going to the infinite dimensional case but restricting to the finite support version yes um so in, in the light matter paper we we proved that you have this lifting theorem mm -hmm. where yes. yeah. you like truncate and like you can show that this truncation works for any cuted dimension then you can yeah like, we can... could have we could have a result like that uh but yeah, but we were trying to have really a result that fuse the infinite uh, the, the equational theory we had in the infinite dimension case rather than truncating to the finite dimension equational theory. But indeed, we could uh, we could uh, we we consider taking inspiration of your uh, on your theorem and uh, uh, just uh, do uh, uh, do do doing something similar. Uh, but the goal of the project was trying to go further than that. But we are not sure we will succeed at that. Okay, I see. But so you can't. Can you? Can you not just uh, use that and then lift the rules? Perhaps axioms. I'm, I'm not sure if that works. Uh, but we we try to lift the rules. But uh, the and that's what we did. But it still uh, it still does not necessarily lift the completeness. Uh, because yeah. just because you have a rewriting for every finite truncation does not mean this rewriting uh, will uh, actually uh, work at, at the limit to be an actual rewriting in the uh, in your because it might it, you might go from a finite number of rewriting rules to an infinite number of rewriting rules in the infinite case if you still right. want to have a finite number of reduction step uh, in the infinite case uh, you cannot just take the limit and on top of that um, if we want a derivation that works in the in the, in the infinite case, uh, we want to get rid of the compact structure. Um, mm -hmm. So the compact structure is kind of annoying. It can it can introduce um, things that diverge. Uh, so if you don't want that, you you have to not use it, um, and. For now, uh, all the well, most derivations that we have in Udit or in finite dimensional systems, um, they make implicitly uh, use of the of the compact structure a lot. Um, uh, it, 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 that's true, but like uh, a lot of compact. For for example, if you just consider the simplest uh, diagram with uh, one output Z spider, mm -hmm. I think that would be normalized no like that would that wouldn't diverge for instance because you have the the k factorial term in the denominator or is that wrong uh yeah so if you consider a z spider here with uh, mm -hmm. one output labeled r your interpretation is r over square root of uh, n factorial and that's that's uh, that's same as the coherent state which is a physical state Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so indeed, uh, maybe there is something to to be done here. So the thing is, we don't accept it uh, in the working progress we are doing right now because it's it doesn't have a finite support, even if it's uh, mm -hmm. normalized. Uh, but indeed, if we if we want to go beyond uh, yeah. finite support, we'll then then this will be a good candidate. In we would try to uh, we really hesitated at the beginning between a uh, finite support and a uh, finite norm uh, or something and I mean you're looking at things that converge uh, we had other issue with things that converge but maybe we will go back to it uh, at a later uh, attempt yeah it's tricky so I mean, yeah, finite support is a good place to start yeah. 
Um, I'll let Sarah ask the next question. Thank you. Thank you. I learned a lot from your discussions. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you look at this uh, uh, equational theory L, then you have this uh, almost like a like a cancellation rule. But then if you go back to the uh, equational theory for the Q did case, mm -hmm. you have uh, this relation presented as a part of a larger diagram there. Yeah. I wonder if you could represent the relation in the mixed dimensional case just by itself, but why you here you need it to go with the W generator? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe a, a, the, there is a question, maybe a simple way to say it is what would it look like if we try to encode the one label that is on the wire into QDIT? Okay, because if you, tr if you take the mixed dimension, uh, you could try to say, okay, uh, if my diagram is mixed dimension, but never use more than dimension seven, I can probably encode it in zoo, into uh, QD seven. Okay. And if, if you try to do say this encoding, there is this question, what becomes the one label? And what becomes the one label? The one label essentially become uh, this context. So uh, what this, is one label? I uh, didn't get if, that. Uh, sorry. If you go back to the other equation, Renaud. Uh, yes. Yes. The capacity annotation. Yeah, yeah, the capacity annotation here, uh, this axiom L is not in all generality. It only exists if you have this label, this uh, capacity annotation one. Oh, okay. okay. And the question is, when you go back to fixed dimension, those capacity annotation, you need to translate them in some way. And uh, it will be, tr and the translation of this capacity annotation will almost be uh, this uh, black node with uh, one and a white and uh, and a W node. It will not be exactly that, but uh, in fact, uh, it will be that with just an additional white node to close the, the dangling. Uh, uh, I mean, it will be almost that. So this action L here is almost the translation of uh, what happened is a mixed dimensional it's just that since we no longer have the possibility of saying, uh, of putting a capacity one, we need another way to put a capacity one. And uh, this thing here is also putting a capacity one. Why is it putting a capacity one? It's saying I have a, a cat one that either go left or right. Uh, so I have either cat one and cat zero or cat zero and cat one. Uh, so the only thing that can go to the loop are cat zero or cat one. Because here, the cat one that goes to, to the W node will either go left or right. Mm -hmm. And the other way around, you have, uh, and the other uh, direction, you have a cat zero. Mm -hmm. So here, within this context, the loop can only have cat zero or cat one or a combination of both. So there is an implicit label. This context is uh, making an implicit capacity one on the loop. Oh, like just now, you define the W generator as you have. Um a linear combination of all the cat states of Hemingway one. Now, if you add this input there, then uh, right here, then- So, yeah. So here, uh, if you take the W node and you have some cat K that arrive at the top, so let's take cat one, the cat one will be split into a sum of integers that sum to one. So either zero plus one or one plus zero. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a cat one at the top, uh, all the in fact, in fact, if you have a cat k at the top, all the things that are uh, that uh, that are uh, below will be small uh, that will be smaller or equal to k because mm -hmm. they sum to k. Yep. So if you have a cat one at the top, it's as if on all the wire at the bottom you had the capacity label uh, one because you know that they will have for value at most the one. Mm. And the capacity here is is the same as saying that the hemming weight of the bit string is equal to one. When you say capacity no, being one, uh, the capacity by capacity, uh, the capacity is uh, really saying uh, you are, you're looking at QDIT. So the QDIT uh -huh. could be equal to zero, one, two, three, four, etc., up until D mm -hmm. or D, D minus one. And the capacity uh, is this D minus one or the maximal integer you can put in this. Uh, in uh, in this wire. Mm. 
So in uh, if you if you only have bits, the capacity is one because you have only zero or one. If you have treats, the capacity is two because you have zero, one, two. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the um, the interpretation that you mentioned, the one when you have the sum of the bit strings where the weight is one, mm -hmm. uh, this one works just for qubits, actually. Um, let's do this one here. Oh, okay. And then um, we generalize this as oh, this thing. So actually, if you if you take d equals two, um, you can understand the, the trapezoid here as mm -hmm. two occurrences of the W node where this time the, the interpretation is indeed the, the sum of the um, uh, of the bit string of, of weight one. Mm -hmm. um, Axiomatization of QDIT ZH, um, does this give you back the original qubit um, Axiomatization of complete ZH, is that is a sort of like a generalization, direct generalization of that, or do, is it a slightly different in certain ways? Um, mm. We can reprove it, but since we don't have a fermionic swap, a fermionic swap and stuff yeah. like that, it will not be exactly the same. It will be an equivalent yeah. one, but not the same. Mm. Also, I think Amar, Amar didn't really look at minimality. Um, so, 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 so there probably is some redundancy in the rules. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah I know you're interested we, more in making it logical and stuff, like being yeah, able to push if, if we take our axioms and, and do the, the translation, uh, which is <laughs> when we uh, turn this one back into this, in the QDIT case, uh, we will end up with a lot of stuff that, that Amar has or up to a slight transformation, I think. Um, mm. So the Z spider is already there, obviously. This, I think, is already here because uh, Amar already considered the, um, the, 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 the monoid that you get from, um, from the two W nodes, um, right? Uh, the trapezoid. Yeah, I think he, he axiomatizes it as like um <clears throat> as like an algebra structure, so something that's associative, commutative, all those yeah. things. Yes, yes, yes. So so a lot of those actually you can you can recover here. So you have bialgebras. Uh here this one will be different because we don't have the fermionic swap. And we use the the the, the trick uh, from ZXW where you have the context instead. Yeah. Um and I think it should encapsulate. Uh, the X rule, if you if you know the the axiomatization by by Amar, which is the the one that tells you how to remove uh, the fermionic swap exactly. Mm. So it it this one does both. It uh, it tells you how to do the by algebra, and also how to remove the uh, the fermionic swap at the same time. I think. Um, <laughs> And then th there will be tautologies as well. So so this one, I think, well, this one will just tell you that you can get rid of loops. Uh, and that's it. Mm -hmm. and so, because so because this... in the qubit version, this thing here, this thing will be uh, reversible. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, then the self loop should probably go away. Yeah. 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 Um, so do, does this also tell you something interesting about um, ZX, the uh, qubit ZX calculi? Like, does it, um, <clears throat> say, give you a different way to reprove some, like, harder axioms? Um, well, it, 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 it has been used um, to prove the completeness of ZX oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. for qubit systems, for, for finite dimensional systems, for finite dimensional systems, um, where, well, it's pretty much this one, but it was the previous version. So, so it, the, the the axioms were a bit different, but it was this one that was used. Um, and this time, the proof was through a, um, a, a translation from ZW to ZX. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I guess like if you want to prove something like the generalized Euler rule, that you would have to sort of go through normal forms because there's nothing in here that sort of allows you to take a shortcut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. there's no trick. There's no trick trigonometry. Trigonometry here you can do. Mm, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, you can You would essentially just calculate the normal form of the one qubit unitary, and then we just take two different ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, yes.
Uh, and then if you want to do the proof by, by translation, I, I don't remember, I don't think there is a, a, a Hadamard decomposition or a, a Fourier transform decomposition uh, in the mm -hmm. ZX for finite dimensional systems, but I might be wrong. Um, there's a very complicated one which uh, which is not which is not like the three rotations yes okay okay it's, so it's still there in the, in the zx for finite dimensional hilbert spaces um, uh, this morning i wanted to have another look at that paper so i don't i don't uh, say anything wrong but then i realized that again the, the, the archive uh, is still down at least for me it is so in your first uh, version of the paper, which is what we use to translate ZX completeness, yes. you had this normal form of Z spider as a as a rule, and now you have replaced it with something much simpler. Yes. So how do you recover that? Um, so again, I uh, should uh, give credit where it's due. This one was found by um, uh, our intern who worked on the, the infinite dimensional case, uh, Antoine Guillemin Crepon. Um, so we he tried to have a go at simplifying stuff, and indeed, this works. Uh, and now, how do we recover that? Um, how do we recover the previous normal form? Um, so what you want to do is, if I remember correctly, so d, d minus 1 already, you have to decompose it as a bunch of ones um, that are on the legs of a W node. Uh, then you will have to use. How does that work? How does that work again? Hmm. I might have to go look at the, the proof. I don't remember it. Uh, it's okay. I, I can have a look at yeah. the paper. Uh, again. Yeah. Sorry, I don't. I don't have this at the top of my head right now. Um, yeah. No problem. My question is about the normal form. So just mm -hmm. now you wrote m psi is equal to psi. So it looks like the normal form is stabilizing the state. Um, I didn't get why did you choose the normal form to uh, behave that way? Yeah, here, the lemma. Um, so, so here really this n is, I have to remember, sorry. Uh, n is something that takes uh, an arbitrary quantum state and maps it into a ZW diagram. Mm -hmm. And what this tells you is that um, the diagram we end up with, uh, its interpretation is just the state we've started with. Um, so, so if so, we think of N as a linear map, it says that we're mapping the state to itself. Is that correct? I don't know if you can understand it as a linear map. It's more of a functor. Uh, it's a functor between, uh, well, from Q D D to uh, Z W D in that case, mm. right? So, well, is it actually true then? I don't even know if, it, if this is uh, a functor because I'm not sure how it uh, how it behaves with compositions. But actually, it doesn't. Uh, so, so it, no, it's not it's not even a functor, but it's a it's a map if you want. Uh, it's a map between um, well from Q D D to Z W. Uh, diagrams, but it's not it's not a linear map that you would apply to um, to a given state, for instance. Mm -hmm. right. right. It's not the it's not the action of of a, a linear map or a matrix on mm -hmm. the, on. The... Mm. And on the same slides, you have this D with the bending of the wire. And you have this like two brackets here. Uh, what do you yes. mean by the last I, li last? Yeah, it's, it's a notation that I think comes from category theory, I guess. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's just a matter of notation, I guess. Here, so so it's the, the here it is the state that you get from D mm -hmm. by bending its wires, its input wires into output ways. Um. Right. And and can I think of this as the transpose of the matrix that correspond to D? It is uh, it is indeed a partial transpose. Yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. 
Um, if you were to if you were to also bend uh, the outputs back into inputs, mm -hmm. that would be the proper transpose. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. here, uh, maybe maybe in terms of uh, direct notation, it, it's it, it might be clearer. If you have uh, a morphism expressed as a sum of uh, of ket bras, okay, then uh, by turning D into this one amounts to uh, turning the, the bras into cats. If, yeah, if, if uh, we express the direct notation in, uh, in the canonical base, basis. Right, I'm so sure. you only change bra to cat, but you don't change cat to bra, so that's what you meant no. by partial transpose. Yes. Yes. yes, Yeah, but basically you're transforming a matrix into a vector. Rather than transforming a matrix into a matrix, uh, a Z transpose matrix. So mm -hmm. you're doing half of the job where you take your matrix, you forget you and uh, you linearize it, and then you could rematrix it into the transposed, but you don't do this last step. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. I may. Uh, can I ask one last question about the relations that you presented? So uh, when I noticed when you answer Rosine and John's question, you're saying that in some of the relations, you combine the copy rule and by algebra rule. Mm, so if yes. you go to, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's this slide. Um, what's the, like, is, is there like any reason that you want to combine these two rules together to construct this table? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first reason is that, mm, well, the two rules can be seen as, um, uh, two occurrences, let's say, of a, of a larger rule schema. Mm -hmm. So already it's nice for, um, well, to remember all the rules. So that, that gives you one fewer rule to remember. Mm -hmm. So it's already nice. Um, and also technically it's, uh, it's simpler also for us to prove the minimality, uh, because the fewer, the fewer, fewer equations we have, uh, the easier it gets to prove minimality. Um, but if yeah, you want to I, use I, this rule for optimization, then yeah. you are less your lack of the atomic rules, right? Because now you are saying these two rules must appear together for you to use them. Instead of you could have the liberty to choose whether you only want to use the copy rule or you only want to use the bi-algebra rule. Um, in any case, in general, you cannot use one and the other at the same time. So whenever you have uh, you have. Um, an occurrence that you of you know one one pattern like this that, that you can see inside your diagram. Um, well, yeah. No, technically here, if you if you see such uh, such a pattern, um, you you the well the arity n and m will be imposed by the, the diagram itself. So you have no um, no choice into uh, well, between between the copy rule or the Bayer algebra. It will be just uh, the occurrence of this larger rule where mm -hmm. you have n and m. Mm. Um, yeah. So in terms of automation, also I think it makes sense well, that define that depends, I guess, how you how you do your automation. Uh, but if you do it graph based, uh, I think it's better to go with this kind of of things where. You're just pretty much looking at a pattern here. If you want to apply the B1 rule from left to right, mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to do that, you know, look look for an occurrence of that of that pattern so that you can use the rule. All you would have to do is to try and find a pair of uh, Z spider and W spider that are connected um, to through the, the input of the W. Mm. And then, well, uh, the 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 rule you want to apply is then just determined by n and m. Mm. So it makes, I think, if you if you if you want to do automation uh, based on the graph structure of the ZW diagrams, I think it, it also makes sense to have generalized rules like this. Thank you.